Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Edisons. Michael's a mathematician and economist with expertise in the finance, energy, and sustainable development fields. He is an adjunct associate professor in the Division of Environment and Sustainability at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot. Pleasure to be here. So you have a, a piece um, circulating in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, um, which has turned a lot of heads uh, in, in, I guess, my my nerdy little sub-community of, uh, of nuclear advocates, the folks that listen to my podcast and that swim in, in energy Twitter waters. Um, it's titled, We Need to Get Serious About the Renewable Energy Revolution by Including Nuclear Power. Um, so I'm very excited to, to bring you on and, and to chat about this piece. Um, you know, on this podcast, you know, I, I do a bare bones introduction, get some bona fides out of the way, the boring stuff, but then I really like to get a more substantive, um, introduction from my guests, a self introduction. Um, you have a long and illustrious career. What I'm really interested in exploring though, is that, you know, you've been on this sustainable, um, energy, um, road for quite a long time. I think you have some very interesting perspective, uh, to lend to us. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping you can kind of self intro, but you know, you've got a really interesting resume. You were a former board chair at the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, you had a research position at the Solar Energy Research Institute, which is better known now as the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Why don't you walk us through, a, you know, I guess in a sort of briefish way, if I can keep you to a minute or two, but just um, help help our guests understand, uh, you know, where you're coming at um, in terms of authoring this piece, where, where you started your journey. Well, I guess I guess I have to say. I mean, I think it's very uh, uh, a kind of a crucial fact that I've uh, I've always been an environmentalist, but uh, but of the John Muir type, uh, preserve wilderness, um, uh, explore mountain areas. Um, environmentalism has changed somewhat, but uh, I think my uh, uh, finally. Uh, uh, thinking maybe nuclear energy is a good idea is because I just want to preserve as much open space and uh, wilderness as possible. Um, so uh, I got I got a PhD in pure mathematics, which is uh, inscrutable to almost anybody else, and um, then uh, decided I wanted to get a job in some applied field. At the time, the Vietnam War was going strong, and uh, all the technology companies I would have wanted to work for were making things like anti-personnel weaponry. And so somebody suggested I try this fin financial company, a brokerage firm. So I did, but uh, I, did, I didn't like it at all. I mean, I, I stuck with it for a few years just so as not to feel like a quitter. But then I decided I wanted to do something else and uh, um, found that this Solar Energy Research Institute was looking for people, and it was in uh, at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. And you know what could be better? So I uh, I <laughs> managed to get a job there. It wasn't that easy, and uh, worked there for a while until the Reagan administration cut that by about two thirds. So I had to do. I wound up do, doing computer programs for the basically two computer programs for the finance field and uh, kind of stayed very much in touch with the uh, environmental issues and all of that, that uh, spent much more time on that than on my, you know, paid work, so to speak. And, and I've also, also always uh, volunteered to teach uh, at universities. So that's, that it's always been kind of some adjunct status of one sort or another. I've taught the, probably as wide a range of courses as just about anybody. But before currently teaching environmental economics, uh, five, five years ago, I taught cryptocurrency. So <laughs> so you, um, you mentioned in the piece, um, you know, that you were on the board, um, or board chair at the Rocky Mountain Institute. And, and you know, we've we've uh, did an episode dedicated to Amory Levins on this podcast, um, and absolutely, you know, interesting character. You know, he's um, I, I'd say sort of within the sort of nuclear advocacy community, there's almost a sort of like villain uh, archetype to Amory Levins. And so when I was planning this episode, I had a great guy on, and we did a very nuanced show on him. Um, but I, you know, as is common when you're climbing that sort of Dunner Kruger Hill 
things seem pretty simplistic and you, you get a bit higher, you get a bit of elevation, you see around you and, and the world is a much more beautiful and complex place. Um, and I, you know, despite having strong, strong disagreements with Amory Levins and thinking that he's really screwed us in terms of our electrify everything agenda by, by moving us away from, you know, a, a capacity to, to build lots of big infrastructure that we're going to need to replace fossil fuels, I did gain a real appreciation, you know, watching some of his presentations, um, seeing the, uh, the film that uh, him and his uh, wife or ex-wife Hunter uh, we're in, I mean, brilliant communicator, super smart guy. I think you describe him as, I think the most brilliant person you, you ever met or have ever met. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, one day I'm going to get Amory Levins on this podcast, but until I do, I'm, I'm very interested. I mean, what an important figure. Um, can you share some reflections on, you know, meeting him, working with him, being on the board at the Rocky Mountain Institute? Well, it's very hard for me to see him as a villain. I can tell you that. Um, uh, I uh, um, and and it, and if and if it's true, which is always very hard to say, that uh, some of his works set set us on the wrong path. Well, you know, you can say that about almost anybody. I, sure. the, Ronald Reagan set us maybe on the wrong path, but it wasn't. If he if he looked at the path now, he might say that's not what I meant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Adam Smith, uh, even more so. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I, I, I don't, you know, I can't, this is not any kind of a villain. Uh, he's a very extremely smart guy um, with n knowledge about things you just wouldn't, I mean, you mention anything yeah. and he has an in-depth knowledge about it. Uh, people would tell uh, stories about uh, things he did that were just unbelievable, like uh, attending a meeting and uh, just working on his computer and doing some other things. He didn't seem to be there. And then, uh, and then he just summarized everything and then presented the solution, and everybody said, you're right, that's it. <laughs> right, right. And this, this was not atypical. Um, so uh, uh, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I can't resist. So here's, here's an anecdote that I really enjoyed. I... One one time I went with him. This was this was quite a while ago, maybe twenty five years ago, more than that. Um, I, uh, I went with him in in Aspen to a uh, a New Year's Eve party, and uh, I come in and there's somebody in the coat room that it was hard not to look at two or three more times, who turned out to be Barbie Benton, the uh, the Hugh Hefner Playboy model, um, so it was kind of that kind of thing. And Amory just kind of charged in there, and he he did technological networking. I followed him around. It was fascinating. I mean, everybody he met, he just kind of tried to find out what's the latest in your area of technology, and he just gathers information. It's his. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, but anyway, the, the, uh, so I, I, I guess I must have read his, uh, The Path Not Taken in uh, perhaps 1976 or so. And then I attended a, a talk that he gave. And uh, uh, then I attended another talk that he gave later, and he recognized me, which surprised me a bit. Um, I, I thought maybe he recognized a fellow geek, so, so to speak, technological geek. And that's, that's what really uh, interested me in him, that uh, I, I, you know, there, there was at that time more of the idea that uh, uh, preserving the environment, uh, that Paul Ehrlich came up with this uh, equation, which is just completely wrong, but it was P equals I time, times a times T, I think it was. But, um, uh, no, I equals P times A times T. I think that's the impact on the environment equals population times technology times whatever the third thing is. Right. And um, uh, so that said that technology is bad for the environment, bad for the impact on the environment. And uh, I didn't, you know, I, I guess I believed that. But I also loved technology. I loved the environment and, and I loved technology. I went to MIT, I was thrilled the first, when I first entered the classrooms, I was just thrilled to be there. 
Um, and Amory's approach was use technology to use less energy. And I thought, right. okay, this sounds like, you know, I, I can really relate to that. And, and uh, you know, he is, he is brilliant about uh, finding ways to reduce energy use, to make our use of energy more efficient. In your piece, you talk a little bit about how people conceived of the energy problem, I guess at that time, um, you know, at the time of the path not taken, at the time of the soft energy path, um, in what I'll call Amory's heyday in the 70s. Um, can you frame that for us a little bit now? I think give us that historical context. When we think about energy now um, and the problems we face, it's com you know almost completely um, caught up in concerns about climate, getting to net zero. Um, so give us that historical framing for for you know how how the energy crisis was being was being seen at that point by these particular people so in in a, well 1973 is probably the the uh, the turning point because of the uh, <clears throat> there had al already been some increases in the price of oil by libya and others i th i think the uh, some of those uh, middle eastern the you know the oil producing countries uh, uh, maybe maybe woke up to to the the realization that they were being screwed, perhaps uh, because they, you know, they the the oil majors were running the show and they were paying them, uh, you know, presumably what they wanted to pay, and uh, so they they said, okay, we're going to nationalize these uh, oil fields and then we're going to charge you to use them. Uh, but but then so the price went up and then and then in 1973 there was the embargo because of the um, Arab Israeli war and that pushed the price up some more and then there was another increase toward the late uh, 70s or, or early I don't know 1980 whatever it was so it it added up to about a 12 fold increase in in the price of oil and also a shortage during the embargo. So there were long lines at gas stations uh, waiting to, to fuel up. There were restrictions on how much you could put in your tank. And uh, fights broke out at the, uh, at the gas stations. So uh, there was a lot of concern. And I think the concern about energy at that time was much more widespread than it is now. Now the concern about climate change is probably more limited to a subset of the population. Whereas at that time it was, it was very widespread. And the concern was one, we're running out of it. And uh, natural gas in particular, I remember I, when I was with a, a, a small partnership in, in the finance field, we went and visited a client, a bank in Indiana and we get there and uh, everybody's wearing five jackets and uh, uh, that kind of thing. And it was cold. And they said, there's, there's no gas. And it was generally understood that natural gas was running out. I mean, this sounds a little crazy now, but at the time, because, and it, it actually had a lot to do with regulation of pipeline prices and so forth. Uh, but it, it, it was generally understood that uh, gas was, had already peaked, gas supply had already peaked, oil supply would peak pretty soon, and we we're going to have to get more and more from overseas, from Middle Eastern countries. And there was a, a concern that we, we needed to do, do something about that so that we wouldn't be paying higher and higher prices for less and less availability. And as I mentioned in that article, the, the, the kind of, you know, landmark energy study, this, this Harvard study, um, didn't said almost nothing at all about climate change. One tiny little thing that said, and this may in the future become a, a, big, a much bigger concern. That's all. Uh, everything else was about uh, the, uh, the sh you know, sh shortages, uh, price rises, um, pollution, cities were very polluted at the time. Los Angeles was as bad as Beijing is now. 
I, I, I was there. I remember one day I, the, there was nothing across the street. And then the next day, I noticed there were buildings across the street. Well, it was a change in the wind. But you, across the street, you couldn't see the buildings when, when the air was polluted. And, and so, you know, you, you're laying out the context, what, and it's making a little more sense now to understand the kind of solutions coming out of places like the Rocky Mountain Institute. But just if you could summarize for our listeners, you know, a pretty well-educated crowd, but, you know, you've laid out the problems. So what were the ideas that were attractive at that time? Um, and to what degree have you seen them become uh, from maybe being fringe to being mainstream now? Uh, there was a lot of emphasis on simply reducing energy use. Um, and one of one of Amory's pieces of brilliance, but it almost was it was brilliant in the sense that it went against the conventional wisdom, but it was obviously right. Uh, all the economists were predicting that in the year two thousand, uh, energy use in the U.S. would be two hundred quads, uh, quadrillion BTUs. Um, Amory predicted it would be about 100. And he, w- he was basically right. They, what, what the others were doing, what the economists were doing, was just making, I mean, it's a, a, a very simple and uh, uh, mindless straight line extrapolation or, or exponential extrapolation, really. Uh, without considering the fact that when prices go up, people start to conserve. They find more ways to use it more efficiently. This was Amory's argument that they should do that and they would do that. Um, but I think this, this was uh, latched onto by, a, by the segment that got excited by the path not taken. Uh, Most others just thought we we need to, I don't know, I guess I guess drill more, use more use more coal. Amory actually did suggest that we needed to use coal as a bridge to the uh, soft energy path later. I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I saw when I said this this kind of Amory is villain thing, it, it, your kind of eyebrows went up. And I do want to explain myself. Um, and I, I don't mean it in a, in a simplistic way. Again, I've got a pretty nuanced take on Amory these days. But, you know, in, in the rejection of, of a hard energy path, um, you know, and an emphasis on decentralization, on small is beautiful, um, on conservation and efficiency, which I think, you know, there's there's a lot to that. It's, it's foolish to, to waste energy. It's a precious resource. But if you look at... Um, I think mean, one of Amory's arguments, I think, was that, for instance, using electricity to heat, it's it's inefficient. You lose a lot, you know, you, you lose a lot there in the in the energy conversions, right? And and that is true, particularly if you don't care about climate change, which, as you're saying, was less of a concern. If you look at jurisdictions that heat with electricity, it's places like you know my my next door neighbor province, Quebec, which you know pursued a very hard energy path of building a lot of very large hydro dams and have this you know incredible surplus of energy with which they heat in the winter. And also they're basically helping all the freeloaders around them with their climate goals by providing that ultra low carbon hydro um, to New England, uh, to New York, um, you know, to to some surrounding Canadian provinces. Um, Or France, for instance, right, which pursued a a very hard energy path by, you know, in response to the OPEC crisis saying, okay, uh, we do not have oil, but we have ideas. Um, and building that, you know, 54 reactors in something like 20 years. And, and they actually also do a lot of heating. So in the context of needing to electrify everything, um, those places that pursued n- not a kind of dark, um, uh, hard energy path. I mean, certainly it was a low carbon one, thankfully, in those places. Um, they find themselves well equipped to move forward um, in terms of an electrifying agenda. Because, you know, fundamentally, you know, 85% of the world's energy is is derived from fossil fuels. And the challenge of net zero, the challenge of climate is to replace that. Even if we can reduce the amount of energy we use by, you know, a third or a half, that's still an enormous amount of fossil fuel services that we we need to replace. Um, and so I think that's that's kind of where that argument came from, as well as, you know, Amory has been a longstanding principled opponent of, of nuclear energy, which 
um, you know, I think myself and a lot of my community sees as being really the, the most scalable tool um, in order to to achieve those climate goals. So I just wanted to sort of explain that that comment. And I know as someone who's spent a lot of time with him, he's an incredibly charismatic guy. I didn't want to offend you in terms of that characterization, but just just to explain sort of no, my, right. my rationale I mean, where I'm coming from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I mean, I understand it same I, same way. I understand people. Uh, they might villainize uh, Adam Smith. I don't know. Right, right, absolutely. So let's let's talk a little bit. I mean, we're going to get to sort of the juicy nuclear bits in, in a little bit here, but um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what you what you talk in the piece in terms of you know the the challenges um, of of wind and solar. Of you know you, you talk about the renewables army, which I think is a really interesting term. Um, I, I don't really like the way that sometimes taxonomies and labels can sort of simplify things, but at the same time, we do need terms to describe the phenomenon of groups of people that hold certain kind of common views of looking at things. It's a useful way to kind of help us be more granular and understand the world. Um, I mean, something that drives me personally crazy is just the term renewables because it lumps together so many dislikes sources, right? It lumps together intermittent wind and solar with, with, you know, large scale hydro or, you know, biomass somehow gets to sneak in the door and sound virtuous when it's labeled as part of the renewables basket. And, you know, 60% of the EU's renewable power is actually biomass, which isn't terribly great for the environment. But walk me through, I guess, um, in the piece, you talk a little bit about what you see as as some of the challenges of, of um, you know, wind and solar. I think similar to myself, you've kind of looked at the available options and you say hydro is great, but it's kind of tapped out and limited geothermal as well. Tidal's marginal. Like we're, we're really left with wind, solar and nuclear as our potential scalable option. So I don't know, walk, walk me through your evolving thoughts on, on wind and solar and their limitations. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, those three are the, are the, are the only three big options. You, 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 I think people who uh, argue for renewables, they argue for throwing in some biomass and some geothermal and some hydro and so forth. Uh, so, uh, but, but the mainstays would still have to be wind, solar, or nuclear. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, the, the problem with uh, wind and solar is that uh, obvious, I mean, just in, in principle, you're going to, you could confront challenges in scaling up. Uh, you'll do the cheapest projects in the places with the best resources first. And the, the um, idea that uh, it's economical might come from those projects, but when you scale up, the, uh, the later projects are going to be those that cost more per unit of en energy produced, and this is inevitable. And then at, at some point, you can, you can have a certain amount of penetration of wind and solar, but at some point, you'll, in order to meet the demand, you either have to have a good way to store the electricity or the energy well, the electricity produced by wind and solar. And it's got to be inexpensive enough. Or wind and solar have to be cheap enough that you can waste a lot of the energy that they produce because you'll have to overbuild by an enormous amount to meet the demand at all times. Now I think I think there are answers to all of these things from the you know the well let's say the enthusiasts or the, those who believe we can do it that way. Uh, first of all, there are all kinds of things you can do to shape demand. Um, but I don't I don't know to to what extent these are more theoretical than practical. Uh, there, there's among the people that that construct the scenarios, I think it's more a belief in what we could do if 
everything fell into place and if everybody did it. And yes, I mean, I don't think that the all renewables scenario is impossible. I, even if it were totally economical, I, I think that it will meet up with the kinds of people problems that sometimes get in the way, as they got in the way of, of nuclear energy. Uh, there are lots of protests against wind farms and sometimes solar farms for the very reason that I might have protested years ago, and that is that they take up land. So in, in the article, I mentioned that Bill McKibben had written this article in The New Yorker saying we can, we can do it all, implying we can do it with renewables. And at one point in the article, he mentioned that he was in favor of um, stopping the operation, I think it was, of, of a nuclear power plant in Vermont because he was assured that it would be replaced by renewables, by wind and solar. But then people who didn't want wind turbines on the peaks managed to get some sort of a piece of legislation passed that barred building wind turbines on at the obviously the the most advantageous place for harvesting wind power you know it's, it's interesting cuz for me i asked myself the question i mean i think modeling is is very important there's huge limitations there's lots of things we can't take into account <laughs> There's, you know, Russia invading Ukraine that didn't fit nicely into the, uh, the you know, list of variables that were available for, for a lot of different modeling studies. Um, but when I look at it, I think, you know, is the evidence in? Like, have we, have we done enough yet? You know, what's the real world teaching us? And we have the example of Germany that's, I think, about 500 billion euros into their wind and solar dominant energy transition. Um, using coal for 21% of their electricity last year, the number one source on their grid. They're probably going to use more of this next year because they're also you know, shackled to Russian gas um, to deal with this intermittency problem. And it's like, okay, you have one of the wealthiest countries in the world, you know, a country in the West that's actually really stay, kept its vertically integrated production that hasn't offshored everything that has big industry. If anyone can do wind and solar and figure out the magical storage techniques um, that can get rid of fossil fuels. It should be Germany, right? But instead, no, you know, coal's the number one thing on their grid. They're, they're using so much gas. So for me, I, you know, it, it, it takes me to this, this paraphrasing of, you know, lies, damn lies and modeling. Um, I just, I just see so much, um, bias. And when I, you know, in terms of the quality of, of science, like for instance, I don't want to get sued here, so I have to speak carefully, but in terms of Mark C. Jacobson's work, it's like he's, he's developed, you know, a modeling software um, you know, his own set of, of, of uh, modeling tools um, that will, so he can feed information into. And he has, he's obviously got skin in the game. He knows what he wants that model to spit out. And voila, it spits out that, you know, wind, water, solar can be done anywhere around the world and, you know, um, can, can get us to net zero in whatever the timeline is. Um, I, I, just, I just find myself much more compelled with um, looking at, at the real world. Um, you know, and of course, there's going to be disruptive technologies and things can change that's the limitations of only looking at the real world but i mean if we're talking about doing things on tight time scales i mean what's going to happen in the next 10 years that's so radically different i think we need to pay attention to what we've done so far it's not like we're theoretically looking at a well what if we tried this wind and solar thing i mean countries have really given it a good go california's given it a good go um and it's it's very interesting seeing gavin newsom um saying hey maybe we're gonna have to keep diablo around you after all because uh looking like we're going to face some pretty big blackouts and energy shortfall. So I don't know, that, that's, that's my take. I mean, what are your thoughts, do you think, in terms of the way the modeling lines up with, um, with real-world experience? Um, I have a, a long <clears throat> um, <clears throat> history of skepticism of modeling, uh, uh, most particularly in the financial field, mm, but, uh, but uh, in, in a lot of other places as well. So I... Um, is it it's I mean, kind of a necessary evil? Like it's 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 got a role. We we need it, but it, it 
is it wrong yeah. a lot? I mean, from from the, from your work in the financial field. In the financial field, it's wrong almost all the time. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, Where I mean, how do you define wrong? This is the right. question. But it's it's it, let let's let's put it more clearly. It's useless almost all of the time. Uh, wrong is hard to define because it, right. it's not even clear what what it's trying to get right. I guess pr- prone to bias would be my my concern, and I, I think I just see a lot of in terms of the researchers that are that are modeling. I, I'm not going to label all of them this way, but when we talk about Mark C. Jacobson, there's almost a like he has an evangelical commitment to making this work. And and anyway, I mean I, sh- I shouldn't opine too much because I'm I'm not an energy modeler. I don't you know it's not something I feign to have expertise in. But just from my you know hundred mile uh, bird's eye view, I, I have big red flags popping up. Um, when, when I, when I see that sort of practice and I I can compare it to things in the medical literature, but yeah, why don't we, why don't we shift bases a little bit to your, you you have, we're going to get, keep going through this, this bulletin of atomic science articles, but you know, you, you also have written a piece about, you know, the energy transition and net zero as a, as a moonshot analogy. I thought this was fascinating because, you know, the Apollo program was expensive. I think it was 4% of government spending, but it only cost about a quarter trillion dollars, $280 billion. How, how does that compare to, um, I mean, do you think it's a useful analogy, the moonshot versus uh, getting to net zero? I mean, what were the, what's the relative cost we're looking at for, for a net zero energy transition compared to the moonshot? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the relative cost is an awful lot more <clears throat> for getting to net. Well, I mean, if you really wanted to get to net zero, the and if you insist on it, it's got to be net zero, then the costs would just just go through go through the moon, if I may say so. But the 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 two analogies that people use to argue that we can do it are one is the moonshot but that's of course a very specific and limited goal it's still amazing that we were able to do it given the kind of computing the computers and all of that that we had at the time it's just unbelievable so i think i think it's it's an example uh, that you can say as i i really i, I I love that I came up with that memory that when I went into Jay Jayadev's office, he had this placard in the wall that said, be realistic, do the impossible. Because, um, I mean, it's part, partly comes from rock climbing, which I did long ago. And uh, it seemed that every time some climb was pronounced impossible, clearly impossible, somebody came along and did it. Uh, and the, the, the moonshot was kind of, Kind of like that. It was um, it seemed impossible, but it, it got done. Uh, but it's it's you know it was a limited goal, and uh, once you get the calculations right and you get the power right, I I I guess you aim right. It's, I mean, it's not that simple, but uh, it, maybe it's maybe it's not the hardest thing in the world. The the other analogy that people use, and this is a good one, is how fast we scaled up production of uh, tanks and airplanes in a few short years, not to mention developing the atomic bomb from 1940, well, starting a little bit before 1940, because we were sending things, sending this to uh, to Britain. Uh, but I mean, it was about five years. It's just that, that when I read somewhere that uh, when uh, Detroit, that whoever it was, General Motors, whoever really uh, was assigned the task of, uh, of producing these things, they were asked, how many can you produce? They gave some colossal number. And then they wound up producing more than twice that much. So the... You know, this is an example of uh, maybe you can do the impossible, and maybe you can. But uh, um, I mean, I think energy is a is a is a hard nut to crack, uh, and and uh, it's not it's not like doing digital technology. <laughs> yeah, you're still pouring steel and, or sorry, pouring concrete, laying steel, building turbines. It's not it's not bytes and microprocessors. That's that's for sure. I think there's we live in such a 
<clears throat> especially my generation, I think, in such a time of, you know, the, the digital revolution that, you know, the, the, the changes we've seen you know, in the cell phone, for instance, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough. I mean, I'm turning 40 this year, <laughs> but, you know, just it's, it's, it's unbelievable the kind of changes we've seen in that world. And I think there's we have that sort of expectation for heavy industry. Um, and it's it's a little naive. One of I've had a really interesting guest on um, named uh, Mark Mills, and and he he takes the moonshot analogy and says, listen, I mean, the getting to net zero, the energy transition that we're talking about is kind of the the, the equivalent would be putting everybody on the moon. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. and that's maybe a bit of an exaggeration, right? But we put I think twelve people on. Um, and the other one that he made, and I want to give him full credit for this because. You know, I think so much, I, I often critique um, the the 100% renewables folks and the kind of elaborate Rube Goldberg type um, processes that would have to be in place to maybe possibly try and balance out the intermittency and the overbuilds and the interties and, um, you know, the uh, gravity suspended concrete blocks off of the cranes that are going to, you know, you know, store energy and, you know, in the titles, like just all the stuff. It, it seems like it's kind of a huge contortionism to just avoid what is, a, I think, a much more simple and elegant solution, which is nuclear energy. And so he, he made this, this analogy, which was, you know, if the task was to get everybody across the Atlantic Ocean, we had to fly everybody across the Atlantic Ocean, we could do that in jet planes or helicopters. And I mean, I've flown in helicopters a fair amount. It is awesome. It's a super fun feeling when you just take off and kind of float away and, and just seem to defy the laws of physics. Um, and could you fly everybody or, you know, big chunk of people across the Atlantic Ocean in helicopters? I guess you'd have to probably set up some, uh, you know, offshore landing rigs uh, for refueling. You'd have to probably have to hop over to the Portuguese islands you're on right now as part of our way across the Atlantic. Um, it's, it's not um, the easiest way to do it. We could do it that way. It would be kind of a Rube Goldberg type situation to make that happen. Or we could just people on jet planes. But I think so much of what you know, underlies um, some of the incredibly creative thinking um, and and challenges of of the kind of hundred percent renew or what you call the renewables army enthusiasm is is this well we can't do nuclear that's that's written off the table so we have to make do with what we have and that requires some pretty interesting and and stimulating thinking because you know one thing I've learned from hanging out with a lot of engineers is that they actually really love problems they can kind of the more problems the merrier the more the more the more solutions they can come up with you know it's like you know, give give someone a hammer and everything looks like a nail. They they love these problems. So, you know, you do use that term, the the renewables army. Um, and I'm just uh, again, I'm interested in your reflections on on that tribe, on on the characteristics of that tribe. Um, and I guess I'm not sure how long you've been thinking about nuclear energy now. And you know, I think this article definitely you're 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 coming out and saying, hey, if we're serious about this, you know, if, if we want to have this energy transition happen, it's got to include a lot of nuclear. Are you are you how are you relating now to that group of people? Some, sometimes it's easy to be sort of labeled as almost a heretic for for taking that line of reasoning. G give me your thoughts on on the renewables army and and uh, and on heresy, if if that applies to you at all. Well, I, I I mean the truth is I don't really have much to do with them. I don't have I haven't had anything <clears throat> to do with Rocky Mountain Institute in uh, twenty years, really, okay. uh, since since I since I left the board, um, and I don't. <clears throat> the uh, I, I do bring up, I mean, with some people I know, I bring up nuclear energy. There are some people who just kind of look look un uncomfortable with it and they say, well, I don't know, I have some doubts. Uh, but I don't, I haven't gotten major, uh, uh, no, no uh, Twitter insults. I or whatever it is that happens on Twitter, I don't. Yeah. I'm not into yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you're so definitely I, saving I, yourself. You're saving your yourself uh, your time wisely. You're using your time wisely to not not <laughs> swim in those waters. I mean, what, like one of the one of the arguments um, that I heard pretty early on that I thought was interesting was. You know, I mean, because looking again at what Germany has done, Václav Smil summarizes this, I think, really beautifully. And he says, you know, Germany, just to, I'll, the numbers, I'm going to simplify them and do some rounding slightly to just make it very basic. But, you know, pre-energy transition, they had about 100 gigawatts of power on their grid. You know, that was coal, gas, nuclear, some biomass, things like that, right? Um, their demand hasn't changed. They've now doubled their capacity. So they have about 100 gigawatts of wind and solar. 
and they have 100 gigawatts of coal and a lot more gas and a lot less nuclear now. And so they've doubled their grid without any increase in demand. Um, you know, we're being told that wind and solar are the cheapest thing to add on the grid based, I guess, on wholesale prices. But Germans face some of the highest electricity prices in the EU. And you have the inability to retire, you know, those coal plants. Um, you know, there was a target for 2038. They're rushing to close the nuclear plants this year. Um, but coal's on the table to 2038. I actually got to sit down with the uh, spokesperson of the German Environment Ministry at, at the climate summit in, in, uh, in Glasgow at COP26 and ask him about this. Like, what is the plan around intermittency? And he was like, well, you know, we've got Nord Stream 2. We're doing gas. We're going to do gas for a while. You know, but we'll phase out the gas too. But, you know, with what? With what? They had no answer. Um, and so if this, you know, the, the, this kind of fatal flaw of intermittency, which even the Germans can't figure out, you know, again, one of the wealthiest, most industrialized, ingenious, you know, most Nobel Prize <laughs> in, in chemistry and engineering, et cetera, or sorry, physics and chemistry can't figure out. Um and we build all these renewables, they're still going to need a full backup. And so in your piece, you say, I, I'm trying to get back to the title here. Um, if we're serious about the renewable energy revolution, you know, we need to be serious by including nuclear power. You know, uh, Tom Blees, who's a friend of mine I was talking to, he said, the issue is that, you know, we're always going to need that backup for when the wind isn't and the sun aren't, aren't cooperating. So we need to have 100% capacity there. And if, you know, it's not that that needs to be 100% nuclear, obviously, we'll be using some hydro, some geothermal and other things. But then the wind and solar become sort of a frill that's that's just kind of an expensive um, addition to the system. You know, from the perspective, again, of Germany having to kind of double things and maintain that full capacity. So, I, you know, I'm not trying to kind of push you into territory that's uncomfortable, but I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of uh, clearly there's roles for renewables, particularly in off-grid scenarios, um, perhaps, you know, in areas where it's absolutely the best siting in the world or, you know, that solar production matches the air conditioning demand in a hot southern country. Um, but, I mean, to, to what degree is your, is your thinking on renewables shifting in terms of their, their overall kind of place in the system or how central they should be or, or how important should nuclear be in terms of, of this mix that you're, you're imagining? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that. I, I, I'm, I to be perfectly honest, I'm still learning about this. And I've been talking to some people who know, know more about it to try to understand you know, if you have the, 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 um, the advantage of nuclear power is always on. So, so uh, but demand is not always on. So now Jack Devaney says you can follow demand. Uh, uh, but uh, there, but, but he also says if you got wind and solar, then, then, you can't use the the full capacity of nuclear, so it actually damages the economics of nuclear power. Uh, so, how to combine all these things is something that I'm I'm trying to figure out. And I've um, fortunately I've connected with a couple of people who uh, I don't think they have the answer exactly, but I think they 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 know more than I do about how to do this. Um, as as to the, uh, I think the the renewables enthusiasts, I'll call them that, um, uh, have uh, uh, high uh, hopes and beliefs about uh, storage. Uh, I think they they think battery uh, prices will come down a lot and already have, but other things I've read seem to say they're very high and it's hard to make them come down. Like uh, Bill Gates's book, for example, he said, he said he tried a lot of different things and it seemed to be hard to get, to get the cost of batteries down and the, and the, uh, the uh, durability basically. Um, so, uh, but, you know, it's very hard to, to, to say anything with any certainty about any of this, because you can't tell what technology developments will be in in the future. And I don't think people sometimes make an analogy with uh, uh, with um, data storage, which of course has been a phenomenal story. I, I I still I when I when I went back to uh, kind of having to do some 
work in the finance field. What I did was I retreated into the mountains of Colorado in 1982, and I assembled uh, uh, the new IBM PC, a, uh, a, the, the brand new uh, tall grass uh, 20 megabyte hard disk that it had. It had 20 megabytes. I thought, you know, and we looked at it, and my partner and I, we said, you know, that thing stores 20 megabytes. Can you believe that? And it was huge and it was noisy and it cost $4,000. Now I take out of my uh, little change purse uh, something you can barely see and it's got 128 gig- gigabytes. So th- this, is, this is incredible. But it, to, to use that as an analogy for how other things can come down in price, I think is a, is a big mistake. Uh, it's, it's possible, but uh, from, you know, I, I don't know the, the weight of opinion that, I, that, that I've uh, heard about and read seems to be that we're nowhere near getting the cost of batteries down enough, but it's, it could be that that's wrong. Yeah, I mean, the, the physics, I think, are, are just so different for this digital versus uh, very physical uh, world. You know, it was, it was interesting when, you, when we started off the interview, you were, you were talking about being kind of in the tradition of John M- M- Muir, Muir, um, who we've, we've yeah. talked about a little bit in the podcast. Um, but I, I very much share that bent. You know, I, I consider myself uh, an environmentalist, a conservationist. I, I love wild spaces, want to see them preserved. Um, I'm also, you know, a humanist and most of my you know, activism and my youth was, you know, very much along issues of, you know, anti-war, refugee issues, that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, and it's also interesting you're talking about that context of, you know, graduating from MIT and, and you know, into this world of, of the Vietnam War um, and just how, you know, I think a lot of, uh, from what I understand, folks in your generation, um, you know, when, when looking at the establishment, when looking at um, leadership, I mean, this was the time of the war and also of, of the Cold War, um, you know, just... I guess just kind of trying to understand the count, the counterculture um, from from that perspective of you know when when you sort of came of age, I'm just I'm just fascinated by that um, you know what the world looked like to you and and how that steered you in terms of the path that you took, what the ideas that were lying around were for you to kind of pick up and roll with, um, and I just in the, in the last few minutes I don't know I just uh, that's something that stood out for me. Um, are you aware at all of, of William Siri? Um, oh yeah. yeah you, yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, sure. I found him to be a fascinating figure as as someone who basically helped get Diablo Canyon built and and saved the I forget what the name of the dunes were, but um, you know that those kind of figures. It's it's interesting at that transition point. I think kind of when you're coming of age. I mean, I think Siri's gone at that point, but um, there was this this you know Ansel Adams figure as well. You know, who was we need to do nuclear so that we don't dam our big beautiful river valleys and can preserve nature. I mean, that kind of impetus I find. Um, really consistent with with some of my core values. I'm not sure if that's something that sort of speaks to you, or if that's a reason why you've kind of come to rethink nuclear energy. Yeah, that's that's definitely part of it, uh, and and that was the uh, environmentalists' interest at the time. They, the the bad energy was hydro, um, and uh, uh, nuclear was the great hope. Uh, now I don't know exactly. That was in the 50s, perhaps. Now what? What exactly turned somebody like Will Siri against it? I I don't know. I mean, I Will Siri stayed. I, Will Siri stayed in favor, but um, but it led to the split of the Sierra Club, um, and uh, I think uh, Bauer formed Friends of the Earth. It was a huge schism. But Will Siri, he was actually I think a trained uh, health physicist. Um, uh, but yeah, it's 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 a fascinating story that whole one. But yeah, what I mean, what happened to the environmental movement that they? Yeah, they they had such an about face at that point. I think that's a- a- Amory question. would know it. I mean, he he knew David Brower well. Uh, uh, if I get a chance, I'll ask him how that happened. You know, how, what what turned you against n- nuclear energy? Because he was a a strong uh, opponent of it, and, and, and was the I think the British representative of Friends of the Earth, and his sort of don't know if I can call it his first job, but I don't uh, one one of his first roles. All right. Well, maybe I'll try and work you for a, a connection to Amory, see if I can get him on the podcast. And uh, I've talked about him enough here. It's it's about time I uh, <laughs> actually have a conversation with the guy. Um, listen, uh, Mike, it's been a, a real pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for for sharing your perspectives. Um, I'm going to link the article um, in the show notes, encourage everyone to give that a good read. And I hope to stay in touch and maybe have you back on at some point in the future. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris.